Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about IIH. You can watch the video on the regular version of IIH. What I want to talk to you about is when we would do a bolt intracranial pressure monitoring in IIH. And the two circumstances that we do this in is if we don't have documented increased intracranial pressure on the opening pressure with the lumbar puncture. So as you know, the modified Dandy criteria require that we have an elevated ICP documented on the spinal tap, but sometimes the patient's pressure come back 20 or 18, and then you're like, what? That doesn't technically meet the criteria. In these patients, we're gonna have to rely on both the radiographic features of increased intracranial pressure, and so on MRI, what we're gonna be looking for is fluid in the sheet, flattening of the globe, empty cella, and stenosis of the distal transverse sigmoid sinus. So if we have a 20 plus the MRI features of increased since ICP, that's, that's kind of good enough. On the eye exam, we're gonna be looking for six nerve palsy and papal edema. So if we have evidence of increased intracranial pressure radiographically or clinically, as long as the CSF is normal, we can accept a borderline uh, ICP of 20 to 25. The problem is when you get numbers like 18 and 16, it's hard to use even with these criteria. And so that is one of the indications for the bolt intracranial pressure monitoring. The other is if they already have a shunt in place. So normally we're just testing the integrity of the shunt with the normal things. Shunt series to make sure it's connected, a shuntogram with nuclear medicine, but sometimes we have to do the spinal tap, but even with the spinal tap and the shuntogram and the nuclear medicine, there's some question in some of these patients for which a bolt monitor is necessary to see what the pressure is doing over time. And so when we have intracranial pressure monitoring, we have these waves that correspond with uh, both the arterial phase of the uh, blood pressure, as well as the compliance of the brain and the aortic the valve closure, so that blood pressure pushes the CSF along, and so when we have the systolic, the diastolic, and the in-between thing, the brain compliance, these produce pressure waves that we can measure on intracranial pressure monitoring, P1, P2, and P3. It's this P2 one that represents the brain compliance, and that's the one we're looking for on the ICP monitoring. So as you know, when we're doing ICP monitoring, we need neurosurgery. They're going to put the bolt in. The bolt can go right into the uh, ventricle with a transducer, or we can have epidural. You have to let neurosurgery decide on whether they're gonna put the bolt and how far down the bolt's gonna go. Various different types of these bolt monitors, but they're basically direct transducer measurements of the intracranial pressure. So when we do bolt ICP measuring in patients who have elevated ICP, but we didn't get to see it, the, the P waves might look like this, where the P2 is markedly elevated all of a sudden because we have something wrong with our brain compliance, and that might document that the person whose spinal tap was 18 actually has a pressure of 32. And so sometimes they get really big spikes, and even though these are spikes, not plateaus, they're called plateau waves. So the plateau wave is when you have an intermittent, very short-lived rapid elevation in the intracranial pressure. And the, the bolt monitor can record this, this spike in the pressure. And during these pressure spikes, the patient might be markedly symptomatic. They might have a seizure or a transient ischemic event. And that cannot be detected on a regular spinal tap. So normally we just do the regular spinal tap in IIH, but sometimes we have to have a direct transducer measurement with a bolt intracranial pressure monitor. The two circumstances are when we have a normal spinal tap, or two or three even, or if we have a shunt in place and we are still wondering about the pressure, we're looking at measurements of the pressure that measure the brain compliance, and that is the presumed mechanism of increased intracranial pressure on an idiopathic basis. And we might see market elevations of the intracranial pressure, the so-called plateau waves, and all of those would support that even though the ICP was normal in the spinal tap, it really is idiopathic intracranial hypertension.